much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I'm such a I'm such a fan of um, Dr. Donaz and of the organizations that have come together to do this important work. Uh, I, as you just heard, I serve as the Director of Research at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. And this year, we are celebrating 20 years of informing the public and the American Muslim community on what's important to American Muslims. And it's in this, in, you know, in this spirit that I'm going to be presenting kind of the uh, foundational information that I hope that you will reference throughout the day to really ground our conversations in the facts. Next slide, please. So at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, our mission is to provide objective research and education about American Muslims in order to support well-informed dialogue and decision-making. And that's exactly what you all are doing all day today. We do two broad you know, areas of work at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. We do research and education that builds understanding and that strengthens communities. And you can learn more about our work and read all of our research free um, and open to the public at www.ispu.org. And I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in about who American Muslims are and what is important to us. First, it's important to understand that Muslims in America are the most ethnically diverse faith community by far um, of any other faith community we studied and uniquely have no majority race. There's uh, an, a pretty even breakdown of um, American Muslim uh, groups between um, people who identify as black or African-American, white, Asian, and Arab with African-Americans at 28% making up the plurality of American Muslims. 8% of American Muslims are also Latino. And, um, and then we have 5% who identify as other. It's also important to point out that one to 2% of American Muslims identify as Native American. Next slide. Next slide. Now, the other unique demographic uh, fact about American Muslims is our youth, is our young people, and the fact that they make up nearly a quarter of our community. And when I say young people, I mean 18 to 24. That obviously uh, could be even more than, uh, even larger age range than that. But even if we just define it as 18 to 24, that's a quarter of our community far more than a far larger share than any other faith community. Next slide. Now in terms of immigration uh, status, a half of American Muslims were born in the United States and half were natural, half were born outside the United States with the majority of American Muslims being US citizens, 86%. So this really tells us that uh, it's not accurate to talk about American Muslims as immigrants and only immigrants, but immigration is still very, very much part of the American Muslim narrative. Next slide. Now we often uh, talk about American Muslims in terms of a model minority um, narrative. And it's important to understand that while many American Muslims are uh, you know, working very highly paid professional jobs. We also have a, an important share of our community that are really struggling economically. So nearly, a, actually a slightly over a third of American Muslims uh, are making just at or just above the poverty line um, and more likely to be in that category than any other faith community. So poverty is also a part of our story and that needs to be addressed as well. Next slide. Now what's important, what's important to American Muslims according to our 2020 poll, um, and this is a nationally representative survey of the American Muslim community. Our top priorities are 
healthcare, the economy, as well as social justice causes. Next slide. Speaking of social justice, I'd like to share with you some of the information that we've gathered on Islamophobia and why it's a threat to every single American, not just Muslims. Next slide. So we've designed something called the Islamophobia Index, and it's a measure of the level at which the public endorses anti-Muslim stereotypes. And these specific stereotypes that we're measuring are ones where um, other research outside of ISPU actually has found that when people endorse these specific stereotypes or tropes, they are more likely to also accept or endorse anti-Muslim policies. So what's really unique about these stereotypes is that they are linked to bad policies, to the public accepting and endorsing and consenting to bad policies. So please go back to the previous slide. The, uh, the Islamophobia index um, is from zero to 100, uh, you know, ranges from zero to 100. And, um, and we measure it every single year um, among different faith groups. Now in 2020, what we found is that among the Jewish community, that index score was 16. Among the Muslim community, it was 20. Non-affiliated was 21. The general public, 27. And then you have Catholics and Protestants very similar to each other, 29 and 30, and then the highest white evangelicals. And that has always been the case ever since we started measuring. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that Muslims themselves are not immune to endorsing anti-Muslim stereotypes. In fact, slightly higher than the Jewish community in 2020, which I think will surprise a lot of people. So there is an issue with anti-Muslim sentiment in the Muslim community. And I think we've ignored that as a concept um, for far too long. So next slide, please. So why should you care about Islamophobia if you aren't impacted by it yourself? I said it was a threat to every single American. The reason it's important to be worried about Islamophobia other than just caring for your Muslim neighbor is because it's bad for democracy and it's bad for security. Um, a higher Islamophobia index is linked to greater public acceptance of military targeting of civilians. It's also linked to a greater acceptance of individual targeting of civilians. Um, so endorsing Islamophobia is linked to being more likely to endorse violence uh, against innocent people. It's also linked to greater acceptance of authoritarian attitudes like suspending checks and balances and limiting freedom of the press in the wake of a terrorist attack. And unsurprisingly, it's also you know, linked to greater support for discriminatory policies against Muslims themselves such as the Muslim ban and surveillance of mosques. Now, that last one isn't surprising. We expect that if you endorse anti-Muslim you know, stereotypes, you might also agree with anti-Muslim policies. But what I think is a little more surprising and perhaps not something that people automatically realize is that it's bad for democracy. It's bad for our freedom as a people because it is fueled by fear and fear kills freedom. So Islamophobia is bad for democracy and security. Next slide. Now, what predicts Islamophobia in terms of you know, demographics? A lot of times people think that it is about religious affiliation. Now, I, I mentioned that year after year, white evangelicals come out you know, as, as having the highest Islamophobia index. But interestingly, when you account for um, all other demographics, religious affiliation actually is not significant. It does not predict being, you know, having a higher Islamophobia index. Um, now, let me start with what does predict it and then, and then tell you what doesn't. For Muslims, it, interestingly, and we have to dig into this so much more, experiencing religious discrimination makes Muslims more likely to endorse anti-Muslim 
stereotypes. Now, I think we have a lot of mental health professionals in the audience. Maybe they can, you know, give us some insights why that might be. Uh, I think it's fascinating. Now, for the general public, the the factors may not be as surprising. Being very conservative is is one. It's more political affiliation. So, political affiliation predicts Islamophobia, not um, religious affiliation. So, you know, identifying as a Republican, identifying as a conservative, um, having lower education, actually even having lower income, and experiencing religious discrimination in when you're not a Muslim actually also um, is linked to anti-Muslim sentiment and then being older. What does not matter, what is not significant is your race, your religiosity, if you're devoted to your faith or what faith you, you are devoted to. And for Muslims as well, none of those things matter. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what kind of discrimination are Muslims experiencing? Muslims are more likely than other faith communities to report having experienced interpersonal religious discrimination. You know, religious discrimination that you might have, you know, from your fellow workers or school students, um, discrimination in just, you know, randomly from a stranger in a cafe, school, and even interacting with family and friends is, is a possibility. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not sure what happened to our um, PowerPoint. Let's see if we're gonna get it back or if I should just, okay. I think we were just about to start. Um, yep, that's the slide we ended on. And then if we could go to the next one, we're almost done. Thank you. So as I said, Muslims are more likely than other faith communities in America to experience interpersonal um, discrimination because of their faith. But where they really stand out is that they are far more likely to experience institutional religious discrimination. At the airport, when applying for a job, interacting with law enforcement, or even receiving health care. Next slide. And unfortunately, it isn't limited to adults. 51% um, of Muslim families say that their child has been bullied because of their faith if they um, are in school. Um, and that compares to 27% of the general public. So, you know, nearly twice as likely to be bullied because of their faith. Next slide. Now, what's really alarming for me as a parent is that one out of three of the reported cases of religious-based bullying of Muslim kids involved a teacher or an administrator as the bully. And that really um, you know, opens the door for conversations about better training and accountability. Next slide. Now, how have Muslims responded to some of these challenges? They responded with greater civic engagement and solidarity with other targeted communities. Next slide. First, 
you know, we always hear about um, Muslim, you know, registration to vote might be slightly lower than other faith communities, but where Muslims really actually stand out in the, is in the deeper engagement with their um, elected officials. So Muslims among the most likely to attend a town hall meeting. Next slide. Muslims and Jews are the most likely communities to volunteer in a political campaign, far more likely than Catholics or Protestants. Next slide. Um, if you could just go one one back. Um, so what what the slide you're going to you're about to see loading will will tell you is that american muslims are the most likely faith community to support black lives matter now it's important to obviously remind you that the plurality of american muslims are black so it's not like these are two separate you know communities by any means there's an overlap uh, however i will just also add that asian muslims for example are as likely as Black Muslims to support Black Lives Matter. And women, just Muslim women of all backgrounds, are as likely as Muslims and non-Muslims to identify as Black to support Black Lives Matter. So this is something that has really come out in our data over and over is um, whether, you know, this is obviously not something that we've solved on the ground, but compared to other faith communities, Muslims are the most likely group to over and over express a support for racial equity in the United States. And I think that's something we can build on. I'm not sure if we're gonna get our, um, our PowerPoint back, but it might just be a good time to uh, switch over to our panel, um, just because I think there's been some challenges. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so excited to uh, introduce our panel to you. All three of our panelists really need no introduction, um, but I will, I will just kind of uh, give you an overview of their incredibly impressive background. I'll start with Linda Sarsour, um, needs no introduction, but Linda is an author, award-winning racial justice and civil rights activist, seasoned community organizer, and mother of three. Ambitious, outspoken, and independent, Linda shatters stereotypes of Muslim women while also treasuring her religious and ethnic heritage. She is a Palestinian Muslim American and a self-proclaimed pure New Yorker born and raised in Brooklyn. And there's a lot more to Linda than what I just read, but. I, I want to conserve time so we can actually hear from her. We're also going to be hearing from Mayor Abdullah Hamoud, the son, the proud son of immigrant parents. Mayor Abdullah Hamoud has been an unwavering advocate for his hometown of Dearborn for more than a decade. Now, as mayor, he is committed to reinventing government to deliver results for working families and residents in every corner of the city. Throughout his career, Mayor Hamoud has provided bold leadership for Michigan and Dearborn with a thoughtful, pragmatic approach to government that puts people first. And then Abrar Omesh currently serves as an at-large school board member in Fairfax County, overseeing a budget of over $3 billion for 1.1 million constituents in the nation's 10th largest school division, of which one is my son, so very grateful to Abra's service. She's the first Libyan ever elected in U.S. history 
and the youngest woman, as well as the first Arab or Muslim woman ever elected in Virginia, earning over 161,000 votes and coming in first among non-incumbents in a six-way race. She is also the first Muslim and youngest ever elected in her role. Abrar's journey in education leadership started when she co-founded a student-led, student-run nonprofit organization that continues to provide thousands of underprivileged youth with free tutoring and mentorship across 20 locations over the past 10 years. And again, much more to Abrar than that, but um, we will stop there and you can learn more about them at their respective websites. So uh, are, are we able to bring on our panelists? Okay, I'm I'm sorry, I'm I'm not seeing them. I'm just seeing um the uh posters. So I think if we could stop sharing the screen or stop sharing the, the PowerPoint, I think that would be easier so that we can see the full beautiful faces of everyone we're talking to. Great, thank you. Linda, um, I'm gonna start with you. First of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Uh, it's always great to see you. Um, you know, it's so funny, my question to you, I wrote <laughs> before I saw your Facebook post about being so tired of being resilient. And yet here you are so resilient. Um, you know, we've learned about Islamophobia in this country and what it can lead to in terms of discrimination and even violence. And we've even seen, you know, we've also seen research about how American Muslims are responding to some of this with resilience and solidarity with other targeted groups. And as tiring as it is, and I, I hear you, I hear you sister about that. I think you do embody the spirit more than anyone I know. Uh, please talk to us about resilience and the significance of this moment when it comes to social justice. Thank you so much, Dalia. Assalamu alaikum uh, to all my colleagues here. Mayor Abdullah Hamoud, um, getting to watch your journey has been extremely inspiring for me. And Sister Abrad, we got your back and we appreciate you and all of your leadership. And to ISPU, um, you are part of the progress of our community, being able to understand and contextualize our work in social justice and the studies and research that you do has really given us the tools that we need to be able to tell our story and make our case to philanthropy, make our cases to our partners to include Muslim Americans and Muslim communities in their issues. You know, I will say that um, our community uh, makes me proud every day. Um, and for, for folks who are exhausted by our community, because my community exhausts me too. Um, so it's not just wor the world exhausts me, the Muslims exhaust me too. But even amidst that exhaustion, we have seen so much progress and the progress has come at the hands of the young people of our community, the young adults in our community, our college students, the women leadership in our community that has really figured out how to operate and engage in a country where we see our liberation and rights tied to other people, to other marginalized people. And I think why we've seen so much progress over the years, and as you um, stated, Dalia, around the kind of, um, the, the increase in support, for example, for their movement like Black Lives Matter, that is because of the work of Muslim organizers, um, and Muslims who have took it upon themselves to be part, not just to go to a rally, but to really be part of the strategic responses, um, legislative advocacy around racial justice, criminal justice issues, making the connections between our immigration detention centers that have heavily impacted our immigrant Muslim communities, the incarceration system that actually also impacts our Muslim communities, seeing thing, uh, legislations around uh, strengthening hate crime legislation and seeing the plethora of a coalition that we could put together. I think for me, my resilience comes from my allies and from those that I have built solidarity with um, over the years. It has come from leadership in the Muslim community who has realized all of a sudden, which they should have probably 50 years ago, or maybe 100 years ago, maybe more than that, 
um, that living in a country like the United States of America, you cannot fight for Muslim Americans alone. You cannot fight for our Muslim communities alone. There's no fight that you could have around education, around immigration, around health care, around women's issues. There's no way that you can say, I am a Muslim leader, I am a Muslim organization, and I can only fight and I will only fight for Muslims. I think we have become much more sophisticated. And also really, for me personally, it's not even a, a, a matter of sophistication. It's a matter of understanding that we really are all in this together. And I remember that, you know, ISPU has done research prior to this that really created kind of a map to show us that the same people that do anti-Sharia legislation are the same people who are uh, unequivocally pro-law enforcement and will block any kind of police reform legislation, are going to put forth anti-immigration, anti-refugee uh, legislation, anti-reproductive rights. I mean, it's all, they, they have a plan. And the plan is to marginalize those of us who are already marginalized in this country. And so in order for us to continue the progress that we've seen in our communities is to understand that, understand that in that context. And that brings me to the, 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 the understanding of everybody's role, you know, um, Dalia's role is to do research, is to make sure that we have the tools and the contextualization and how we and why our community is showing up for certain issues and not others and how we engage and the level of engagement. That's Dalia's job. Um, mayor Abdullah's job is he's a mayor. He is to lead his city, right? He is to ensure that all the residents of his city have all access and the things that they need to thrive. You know, Abrar is his role as an elected officials is to ensure that all students um, in her district are able to thrive, are able to have access to a high quality public education. Um, I'm an activist and an organizer. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a scholar of Islam. I am an organizer. I organize people to do the right thing. I organize people to stand up with the most marginalized. I organize people to advocate. And I think for me, that's what gives me my resilience. My resilience is knowing what my role is. My resilience is knowing that I can compel people uh, to stand up for those who are marginalized. Um, you know, my resilience also comes from my faith. Um, and that's why, you know, when we're doing this work and Abdullah knows this, Abra knows this, we're not gonna impress everybody. And unfortunately people think that to be a leader um, and to organize our Muslim community, it is about impressing every Muslim. Um, that's not my role. My role is to um, inshallah be doing the right thing to and hopefully, you know, have my Lord's approval in the work that I, that I do. And that's what gives me resilience. I, I don't work for the Muslim community. I work to ensure that our Muslim community uh, lives in this country with dignity, um, that our women can go into any spaces in this country and feel safe, um, that our children have access to high quality public education, that no Muslim dies in America because they don't have access to health care, um, and that immigrants who come to this country are welcomed and that they are respected um, and that you are able to, you know, whatever is left of it, um, be, have access to this uh, American dream um, that has been promised to all of us and was promised to our families. And so I, I ask and I say this to all of you who are here today, and especially if you are college students or other folks that are kind of thinking about how you want to get into this work, the time is now. Um, every year I feel like I say that this is the, the year to be involved. Um, unfortunately, it gets worse from here. It's never been about you know who's in the White House. And I think we sometimes in the Muslim community uh, ended up being in a space where we were swimming in this Donald Trump, you know, conversation and narrative. It was never about Donald Trump. You know, racial inequity has existed in this nation since the days of its founding. Discrimination against Muslims has existed for decades, um, and of course, heightened after the horrific attacks of 9/11. Uh, the fight for women's rights in this country has exceeded over 50 years. You know, the the fight for um, you know just the sanctity of Black life has been in this lands for 400 years. So the fights that we're having the, around health care. Um, around just infrastructure, around eradicating poverty in America. These are not new fights. They didn't start with Republicans. They don't end with Republicans. They don't end with who we believe is our opposition. These are long time fights um, and which requires us as a Muslim community to be in it for the long haul and to understand that our wins are not gonna be tomorrow and they're not gonna maybe be next week. They might be five years from now. They might be 20 years from now. They might be even uh, at a time when some of us are no longer here. And I think the question for our community and as we think about 
resilience is what, whether we're willing to put in the work now, even though we may not see the fruits of our labor. And I always think about that. I always think about that there is going to become a time where we will win. Uh, we will win on foreign policy issues. We will win on, you know, seeing even more Muslims in elected office in the highest offices of this land. We will, we will see wins on getting health care for everyone and making sure everyone has access to higher education. And I'm okay with not being here to witness that, um, knowing that at least we as a Muslim community, as Muslim leaders and organizers, at least are putting in the work now for what we believe will be generations of Muslims to come uh, to, to benefit from that. And I will say, and all of you know this, this is not a secret, um, you know, I, I will say I'm probably in our Muslim community probably have been the most attacked Muslim leader, um, at least in the last, you know, 10 years. Um, and I will say that it's not, it doesn't just come from, you know, the, what we believe is the opposition, you know, everyone's like, oh, the right wing, the white supremacist, the right wing Zionist. Yeah, those are on the list as well. But it also comes from liberals and neoliberals um, and people who even who we believe are part of our movement, who still don't understand us as Muslims, who don't understand our beliefs as Muslims, um, who sometimes don't know how to welcome a Muslim woman in a hijab um, in a larger kind of what, what, you know, Western feminist kind of movement in this country. So we get backlash also from folks who are uh, perceived to be part of our movements or people who perceive to care about refugees and immigrants and, and Muslim communities. And so I wanna put that on the table. I also get you know, attacked by our own Muslim community, people who don't understand what our role is as Americans in these United States of America, that we live in a pluralistic society, in a society that where Muslims are just one group amongst many groups um, who are fighting for civil rights and equal rights in these United States of America. And I am um, I'm proud and unapologetic about being an organizer that organizes around this concept of civil and human rights. Um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the foundation of organizing in the United States of America. Of course, our faith plays an important role in the ways in which we fight, in the ways in which we center our, our beliefs. But at the end of the day, violence against any community will lead to violence against other communities. And so we, I will unequivocally never stand down um, uh, if, if I see any group of people who are being attacked in these United States of America, because I know that the safety of others will lead to the safety of our Muslim communities. And so I thank um, ISPU for the work that they do. Um, I hope people continue to support their work um, and understand how important it is. Sometimes people think it's just reports, but these reports have been fundamental to the ways in which we are able to talk about our community in professional ways and the ways we are able to make the case for our communities amongst philanthropy, amongst elected officials, am around legislative policy priorities that we have. And so I appreciate um, Dalia and her leadership in this space. And I appreciate you, um, Mayor Abdullah, you know, for being you know, young um, and taking a risk, um, even when a lot of people, even in our Muslim community told you, you are not ready. Um, they told you that you know, your time was not now. Um, but your time was always um, the right time, um, the time to have a young, brilliant, charismatic leader like you. So I want to say congratulations to you once again, even though you've been there for a little while. Um, and to say that I only see it go higher from here. And to Sister Abrar, I just want you to know that you are an incredible leader um, and you've been through a lot. Um, and you know, you've, you've got to experience many of the things that some other leaders in our community, including myself, have experienced. And then you are resilience um, manifested. And so I hope that you know that we as a community got your back um, and we appreciate all the work that you do. And thank you for um, Dalia and ISPU and all the organizations here today for bringing us together um, on this wonderful Tuesday. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, and uh, I appreciate so much the kind words you just shared about ISPU. I do hope that the data that we just shared does get referenced and, and becomes really the foundation for our work because it's, it's incredibly powerful to, um, to just to center evidence in, in the way that we build strategy. So now I'm going to uh, turn to you, Mayor Hamoud. You know, as a mayor of, as the mayor of Dearborn, um, a city that is famously uh, home to a large Arab and Muslim community, and, and is one of the youngest American Muslims ever to be elected to office, I'd love to hear what inspired you to run for office, and how do you think your experience reflects a new generation of American Muslims? First and foremost, good morning. Wassalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you so much for having me. 
um, Sister Abrar, Sister Linda, I mean, you guys put me on a panel where no matter what I say, I'm not going to meet the uh, meet the bar. Um, I think uh, uh, before I also say that whoever created that PowerPoint slide, uh, the, the brochure and put the angry picture of me, uh, I think I lived up to every angry Muslim man trope in that headshot. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you for using that photo. <laughs> Um, and secondly, Sister Linda, Sister and myself, both, both born on March 19th. So I don't know if there's something about March 19th babies um, and causing trouble, but I think there's, there's something special about that day. You know, what inspired me to run for office, it's a strange journey, uh, you know, not too different from, than many uh, uh, Muslim Americans who grew up as a, as a son of immigrants. Your parents always expected you to be that doctor, that lawyer, that engineer. And I aspired to be. Um, but unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I should say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had different plans. Uh, you know, I grew up in a very working poor family. I uh, lived in 12 different homes by the age of 14. And my parents always uh, taught me that education would be my pathway to success, something that I was good at, but two parents who never had anything more than a high school education. Um, on that pathway to success, my friends and I, we had coined this term before Drake ever came out in the hip hop scene. It was six figures by 26. We wanted to achieve financial stability. It wasn't about being money hungry. It was children who grew up uh, having to stress over the bills that came into the mail. Uh, by 25, I had landed that six-figure interview. Uh, but um, during that interview process, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called for my older brother, uh, Haj Ali al marhum Haj Ali al And when he was called away, uh, in the months that followed, I received a packet in the mail, about 50 pages. And it was about all, from all the people that he worked with and how he impacted their lives. And my brother Ali was 27 years young when he passed. And when I received that packet in the mail, um, I, I stepped away from the corporate world. And I decided that I wanted to be what my brother was to me and to others for the rest of my community. And so I decided to step into public service and do my best to give back to try to improve the quality of life of others. Um, and so, you know, my brother passed away October 15th, 2015. And three months later in January, I had announced my first run for public office for state representative. Never, uh, never planned, never expected. Um, but as they say, you know, you plan, but he plans and he is the ultimate of planners. Um, you know, what, what I think is happening and what's important to also note is we oftentimes have this habit of celebrating firsts and it's great. There's certainly something to be celebrated and lauded about being the first, about shattering that, you know, that first idea of who can be a public servant, who can be an elected official, who can be, you know, and plug in that position. But I think what we have to understand is, you know, real true success is not in being the first. I think true success is in not being the last. You know, there's no, there's nothing great about being the first. And then once you step out of the office, no other Muslim comes after you. Um, I think what we want to do is assume office and demonstrate that we can lead uh, as good, if not better than any other individual from any demographic or religion that came before us. And in that demonstration of success, you truly then begin to open up the pathway, the pathways so that next time somebody runs with a name like Abrar or Linda or Abdullah, um, it's, it's a little bit more familiar and it's not as strange. And you can point to examples of success and hopefully therefore uh, ensure that you're no longer the last in that situation. I think that's, that's the ultimate measure, ultimate measure of success. Amongst young people, what we're seeing now is just really this, this uh, uh, a number of young people not only getting involved in running for office, but being the ones who are also running the campaigns. We have Muslim American campaign managers and political strategists and activists and, uh, and researchers and, and, and folks who are now in the main media stream who are speaking to the narrative of the broader Muslim community. Um, and I think what's beautiful is, you know, it, it's taken us a while to get here and hopefully our parents are understanding that we don't have to be an engineer to be successful, uh, that we can uh, enter these other, uh, these other, these other spaces um, and the success that we achieve in those spaces is equally, if not uh, more important than just being the just being in those traditional uh, pathways. Um, and, and I think that's the proliferation that we're seeing. Um, I see young people all across the country uh, participating, running for office, even if you're not successful when it comes down to the ballots counted at the end of the night. Success is not purely measured as did you win an election or not. Um, it's measured in did you, were you able to uh, change perceptions? Were you able to, um, you know, maybe make the pathway easier for someone to come after you, for generations to come uh, after you? Um, and uh, it's, it's really inspiring to see, you know, I, you know, it's strange for me to say like, yes, I, I look at young people, you know, regardless of, you know, me being considered young, um, but there's a generation after us who I am uh, so inspired by. 
um, and I have so much hope for. And for those who don't know, you know, I'm a new father to a six month old uh, baby Maryam Hamoud. And, uh, you know, the aspirations I have for her, you know, the decision making that I that I do that I have right now in this city is about ensuring that someone like Maryam uh, has far more opportunity than I did in the post 9-11 era growing up here in the city of Dearborn. Um, and that gives me all the hope in the world and the drive so that even when you have opposition from members of our own community or from others uh, outside of the community for, for, for no good reason, um, that's the drive that keeps me moving forward. And inshallah, you know, we're, we're all successful together in that endeavor. Thank you so much, um, Hamoud, Mayor Hamoud. I, I love your story and what a beautiful way, what an inspiring way to honor your brother's legacy and congratulations on your new baby. Thank you so much. <laughs> Abrar, um, talking about the next generation, you know, we just heard from the presentation that bullying is a problem for Muslim students and, um, you know, more than any other faith community in terms of religious-based bullying. And that shockingly one in three of the bullying incidents involve a teacher. We also know that 65% of Muslim families send their children to public school, so the, the majority. And you, as a public school board member, can you help our audience understand what Muslim parents and really any parent needs to know about their children's education and advocating for them, you know, to make sure that they are safe and are learning um, what they need for their for their future. And, and then not only what parents can do, but what the broader community should be doing better to support our next generation's education. Absolutely. Thank you, Dalia. Um, it's, it's great to be here with uh, the likes of Linda and Abdullah, uh, of course, um, but really a pleasure to be with the research community, a community that's seeking to use evidence and data to inform the direction of where we're headed. Um, so peace be on to all of you. Uh, I want to start off just with a couple of reframing uh, thoughts. And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, when it comes to education um, or school boards, you know, we kind of think of it as this marginal, low, kind of lower ranking um, elected office um, or space for us to be involved in. We think more on the national level, we think of foreign policy, perhaps we think of Congress. Uh, but really, the starting point uh, and the foundation of where some of these conversations are, are, are happening and where they're kind of a uh, percolating from is the school board. And we saw that more than ever over the past two years uh, with the, the masking and the, and the vaccine debates. Uh, and now, unfortunately, some of the, you know, I hate to label it this way, but cultural wars that are happening across our country and the challenges of the divides, racial divides and things related to gender identity and whatnot, all of which are, are starting in the, in the classroom with conversations uh, kids are having and then ultimately reflecting themselves in the politics of education. Um, so, and, 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 you know, some public, like national public uh, um, political uh, entities have recognized that and have started investing and pouring money into lobbying in these spaces. Um, so I, I offer that to, to shift the way we think about where influence lies and the importance of engaging and being active in these spaces. The other thing I want to offer is, you know, we tend to, uh, Abdullah touched on how that being a first is not, uh, you know, uh, necessarily how we want to think about things. I'm going to add to that and say it's not all glamorous either. Uh, and that means that there's a lot of grunt work and, and, and effort and time and investment that goes into the most basic of shifts that we can get to. Uh, and so my broader point there is it's not going to take one person to change it. It's not going to take uh, even a small handful, but but it's a cultural transformation that we're seeking. Uh, you mentioned two specific things in your comments. You said you know, that one, uh, one in three of these Islamophobic offenses is from teachers. And so that points to us, there is a systemic problem beyond just a cultural Islamophobic problem that we know is already there. Um, and you also touched on earlier that Islamophobia is internalized, that, that, you know, the Muslim community significantly sees themselves in the same way and advances those tropes. So those are things we have to challenge in thinking about how do we create a wave, not one person, not a couple of people, but a wave that is shifting a mentality on a local level in our communities. Uh, and there are very intentional ways to do that, which I'll speak to in just a second. Um, but the other piece, you know, in thinking about uh, the broader activism space is finding our own space as Muslim Americans where 
frankly, the conservatives and the liberals won't entirely embrace us. And we don't seem to fit fully in either of those camps. Uh, so then how do we lead through compassion in building that wave and coalitions in authentic and honest ways uh, that will advance uh, uh, the broader uh, perspective that we have to share? Um, the other piece I wanted to kind of challenge us on how we think about this is, you know, sometimes we think that bringing change on the school board level or on the, on the school system level is uh, it takes national efforts, it takes millions of dollars, it takes a massive organization. Uh, but really some of the most effective efforts, especially on the local level, where not as many people are paying attention, it's a small but persistent group. Uh, I, literally, I, I, you know, there are live examples that I've seen where a single person, just because they show up all the time, just because they've built relationships with those in power, there is an emotional coercion that goes on to pass things in ways that have, have completely shifted the narrative around certain identity groups and, and, and their belonging. Um, so that's an example we can follow uh, in thinking about how do we cultivate a culture within our school systems that is healthy and productive and helps Muslim kids thrive. Uh, and all kids really when we combat the bullying issue and the idea of inclusion. Uh, but we tend to have, this is another one of my framing points is, um, that we have our own internal barriers to that. We fail to imagine our entitlement in these spaces. Uh, some communities will show up and, and they fully expect that you will change based on what they have to say and they will not go away until you do because they recognize that they're actually stakeholders of these institutions, that public institutions that we're paying for with our tax dollars uh, have you know, an obligation to serve us in the ways that we expect and that uh, don't cause us harm um, but we perhaps approach this by, you know, accepting the fact that our community, that the world is Islamophobic, accepting the fact that, uh, you know, uh, it's normal that on 9-11 people will say very harmful things and that your own teacher will show you videos that reinforce Islamophobia in, school, in the school environment. Uh, but if, if we kind of just take a few steps back and realize there's nothing normal about that. Uh, and that we should show up with that same level of entitlement and organization uh, uh, to, to insist that we see better. So what does that look like on the ground? Um, you know, the, in education, we're, it's, a, it's a more friendly space because there is space already carved out. There are frames that we can lean into. For example, the broader movement on equity and inclusion in education. That's a space for us to be uh, to, to enter where not everyone thinks about Muslims when they speak about you know, DEI and all that work that's happening across the country. But we can create that space within a broader effort that's already existing. The mental health conversation, connecting the dots for people where a student be being bullied because of their identity, not having equity inclusion, in fact, impacts their mental health, which does not allow them to show up for school. And that is part of education's mission. Uh, that is a failure of the educational institution if it's not cultivating a space that allows for the learning or creates the space for the learning to be possible. Um, so those are, those are some of the ways that we can you know, build coalition and enter frames that already exist. For example, there was the national movement from the National Education Association, which is uh, one of the largest, I mean, it is the largest education association in the country, in some states as a union, um, the, the Teach Truth movement, hashtag Teach Truth, right? And that largely came out of cult creating a narrative of it's not wrong to teach our history, all the craze around critical race theory and the confusion meant to demonize basically uh, teaching, you know, truth about our history uh, was an, an opportunity for us to also sh begin sharing our side and our perspective and, and fall into that broader coalition of teaching truth that then creates a, a more uh, inclusive and representative environment for Muslim kids in the classroom. Um, so that's an example, you know, and, and ultimately what does that take? It takes persistent voices that are willing to put in the work. We have to begin developing model guidance on the level of institutions uh, that school systems uh, and, and other similar institutions can adopt and can refer to because we have counterparts who are doing that very uh, work uh, and bringing that forward on the local level to say these are the resources that we want you know, to, to push forward. Um, we have to be building our own local power through, for example, PTAs. You know, to give our community a little bit of credit, there are a lot of Muslim parents who are involved in these institutions, who are involved in PTAs and, and who show up for their kids, but there, there isn't necessarily a strategic vision of how that might influence uh, uh, points of power, like pressure points of power. Uh, so, for example, when 
you know, you have a lot of uh, different Muslim PTA presidents, but there's not that coordination that says, you know what, we're going to target those decision makers and we're going to make sure we maintain a relationship with those holding power and wielding that power. Um, so th those are connecting the dots, I think, of where we are as a community, where we've progressed, but also where there are some gaps. And that's ultimately where our role is, uh, that for every one of us, you know, uh, in our own children's education, being involved beyond just showing up and having those conversations with the teacher, but recognizing who's at the top, who's making these decisions, and let me maintain a relationship, build a relationship with these individuals and make them understand how I'm heard. Because Allah, <laughs> sometimes it's a single email from a disgruntled parent, uh, student that intimidates the entire board, right? The entire power structure to vote a certain way uh, or to, to feel like they need to speak up on a certain issue. Um, so, so of course, you know, that's uh, the part of this broader wave, but all of us have a step in that, whether it's involvement in the unions, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, employee associations, where we are just as entitled to a voice in the space, uh, and that our organizations that already have a lot, you know, strong voice, um, whether that's, again, the PTAs, uh, sustained relationships over time with other communities that will allow us to sustain um, uh, harms and, and be able to be not just on the defense all the time, but in the constructive building. Uh, those are all starting points, but there's so much more to talk about on this subject. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but ultimately, it does start with our own involvement and investment as individuals and in what's happening in our broader in our, in our community locally, and then more broadly, of course. Thank you so much, Abroad. I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, coming back to now, just the entire panel, I'd love to hear you know, we have a lot of up and coming public servants that have joined us today or will be watching this um, in the future. You are all leaders and trailblazers. What advice do you have to young people considering public service, considering organizing, considering being in the public sphere? What is your advice to them? And what do you wish you would have known before you started this work? And um, if Linda, I don't know if Linda's still on, but um, I'll, I'll go back to her. I'll start with you, Mayor Hamoud. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, the, the greatest piece of advice I can offer anyone is to be authentically yourself. Um, being authentically yourself is a very radical thing in 2022. Uh, never shy away. Um, you know, there, there's power in forcing those around you to say the ayn in your name. Uh, you know, I always say, if you can say Daenerys Targaryen, because you watch Game of Thrones, you can say Abdullah Hamoud. Um, it's not, it's not uh, that much more difficult. Uh, and the one thing I wish I knew going in um, that I know now is, even from members within the Muslim community, when you're actively pursuing their support, know that that is what you're pursuing. You're in pursuit of their support. You're not in pursuit of their permission. And permission and support are two different things. If you're actively seeking someone else's permission, for you to run for office or achieve whatever success you have measured out for yourself, um, you'll lose just based on that mental state. If you're actively pursuing support, if they offer it, alhamdulillah, you move forward. If not, it's just you just keep you keep plowing ahead. I love that distinction, support versus permission. Linda, what's your advice to people uh, seeking this kind of career? You know, I'll say I, I'll say it again and I'll say it every time. Just just be unapologetic about who you are um, and and keep moving forward and keep going every day. Someone's going to tell you no. Someone's going to tell you not the time. Someone's going to tell you this is not the right path. Someone's going to say there's going to be so much criticism and skepticism around, along the way. And you just got to run right through it and you just got to keep doing the work. You got to, you know, make sure that you are centering at, at, at every moment being able to center. For me, I always think about who, who are the most harmed people and what do they need? Um, and those are the people that guide me and guide the way that I work. Um, and at the end of the day, I always say to people, I don't want nothing from this life and I'm not getting much while I'm in it. Um, but I want people to continue, especially our Muslim communities, Muslim young people. What are you gonna have in the afterlife um, when you stand before your Lord and your Lord says there was injustice around you. There were things that were happening around you. And I gave you so many blessings. What did you do? And I wanna be able to say, I use Used every blessing you gave me, everything that I had, every resource you gave me um, to, to do what is right, to do what is good, and to help uplift creation. So just keep going. Don't let anybody stop you. Um, and I will just say, if I had listened over the last 25 years to our Muslim community about what I should and shouldn't be doing, I would not be in the place and in the space that I'm in today. Thank you, Linda. 
abroad. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said about kind of following your conscience and leaning into what you believe is right. And that's ultimately rooted, of course, in our faith um, and, and really centering that. And, and in those moments of, of, you know, feeling like you want to do what's right, but then you're going to lose your election or you want to do what's right, but everyone around you is going to corner you and, and demonize you, lean into what's right, uh, because that will ultimately empower you to, to continue that consistency and, and your, with your record and no doubt have God on your side, um, which is critical. But the other, you know, is uh, that rootedness then inspires a compassionate based leadership. And I think there's a difference between coming in headstrong, uh, especially as I think minorities within minority groups sometimes too, our voice has been so absent from the space and sometimes just uttering something that is so basic to us uh, is largely controversial in ways that you would never intend for it to be controversial. Um, but to come in headstrong um, is not always the approach to build the trust first, um, come from a place of compassion and then walk people along. Sometimes those mental steps of how you're not a demon because you disagree with them is necessary and being able to frame things in a way that people can understand. And that's part of the challenge we're seeing with the need for healing all across the conversations in this country uh, of race and, and beyond and class uh, because we're not able to bring people together to feel like they're part of that coalition, but rather it's a zero sum, it's you against me. Um, and that tends to be when we impose and come in headstrong and force our way rather than try to bring people along and uh, cultivate that understanding to help them see why why what we think is important is important. Thank you so much. And, you know, just in, in trying to pull everything together, one point that I think was raised in some of the um, comments that we've been seeing kind of coming along is the connection between our plight and the plight of so many other people. So this is a theme that I heard in all of your comments. And I want to emphasize that maybe end with it is there is a not only a, a, a moral link, but an empirical link between anti-Muslim sentiment and anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism um, and anti-woman, uh, you know, bigotry or sexism. Our Islamophobia is one branch on a larger tree of bigotry. Um, and I didn't coin that, but I love, I love that statement. And it's so true and it's borne out in the research. And so we, we cannot do it alone. We must do it in coalition. And I think that this is what we're all trying to do today during this conference. Um, I'm going to just allow, you know, just kind of my, my final question to all of you. Every single one of you uh, has been attacked. You've been attacked for your identity. You've been attacked for um, what you've said, what you failed to say. And this is part of being a Muslim public figure. Uh, I've I've certainly experienced it, but I don't think people who haven't experienced it are ever ready. And I don't think we're even ready for the next time it happens. What is, what is the internal dialogue that we need to have with ourselves when that attack happens? Because I, I want to get the folks who are, you know, up and coming ready for it because so many people quit after that first you know, onslaught of social media abuse. What do you say to yourself and how do you reach out for support to get through that, that fire, that hardship of being attacked? And I'm gonna end there. Um, I'd love for all three of you to comment on that. I can start. Um, it actually reminds me of a quote um, and I hope people, uh, contextualize me in this quote as well. It's a quote from Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, that says, I want to be remembered as someone who was sincere. Even if I made mistakes, they were made in sincerity. Uh, and I think that, you know, when I'm under attack, depending on where I'm under attack from, you know, there's a question of humility. You know, maybe I was wrong. Um, this idea that we double down sometimes, you know, there are times where I've tripled and quadrupled down because it actually what I said is something that I truly believe in and I will defend myself in those situations. But there are times where we, you know, could have used better words. There were times where maybe, um, you know, we said something from a lack of understanding um, or maybe there was a lack of education and communication as abroad talked about taking our people from point a to point b but the internal you know discussion that i have with myself is i gotta just get back up 
Um, I cannot um, and will not um, allow social media, you know, backlash to stop me from what I'm doing. I think that there are intimidation tactics. There is Cointel Pro that is happening to silence the most effective Muslim voices in our community. There are people in our community that have helped us make strides for our community. And what I hope is that we as Muslim leaders who are under attack do not have to ask for support. Our attacks are usually quite public. Um, and I hope that our Muslim leaders and our Muslim colleagues and spiritual leaders reach out to us sometimes um, because sometimes we are also dealing with not just the backlash but our own mental health issues um, kind of it's sometimes it's the word it's us against the world um, and the world against us and it's important that we reach out and uplift one another and be able to provide those um, support and resources but for me like I said you know I believe I was chosen for this work so I'm not going to allow those things to stop me from what I'm doing in fact it actually fuels me to keep going higher and double down even even more on some of the social justice work that I do. Um, so if anyone here has ever been or will ever be under attack and have their day on social media, and I've had about many days and months and weeks and years on social media, uh, keep going. Um, I think if, if, we, if, if anything, if we here can show you that we could come out on the other side and still do the work, then I think anybody can. Thank you so much, Linda. Mayor Hamoud. Thank you so much. Um, you know, and, and, and in no way am I diminishing anybody's experience. I can only speak to the attacks that I've, that I've you know, encumbered. Um, you know, willful ignorance is prevalent and it's a very dangerous thing to be willfully ignorant, especially in the era of, of over-information. What I tell individuals though, is the best thing you can do is be proactive and is to not react to every social media comment that's out against you. Uh, I remember uh, in my mayoral campaign, uh, my wife would see me on the phone for hours and she'd be like, what are you doing? I'd be like, you know, I call it strategic intelligence. What it actually is, I'm just reading every comment made by every single troll. And I'm just, I'm just burning my soul away by reading at all these comments uh, that are personal attacks against me for my faith, my, you know, whoever it might be. Um, so no matter what you brand it, you can call it strategic intelligence, you can call it you know, whatever you like. It's a waste of time. Uh, it's not, they might be, the, willful, the willfully ignorant might be loud, but they're not the majority. And if you keep that uh, at the top of your mind, you'll continue to, to, to work ahead and earn those votes for those individuals or, or reach out to those who really matter. The most marginalized are oftentimes not in the spaces that are, that are speaking uh, uh, in, in terms like this. So if, if you keep that top of mind, if you stay proactive, run your game plan, um, and Charlie, you'll be successful. Thank you so much, Abrar. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this question because it's 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 speaking to the point that resiliency is actually cultivated. It's not you just step in and you just have to be strong, but you have to put in place the measures, the mental conversations to be ready for that. Um, and building off of Abdullah's point that your perspective as a public servant will be skewed actually if you give attention to any of that. And, and I think for, for me, it was also important to just recognize actually this is totally normal and totally expected that if you were to be representing a perspective or a community that has been so long not represented and that the conversations you know, around our identities and our needs and all of that haven't even been broached, then it's only natural that the, 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 uh, the reaction to that is gonna be strong, it's gonna be sustained because there's a reason those perspectives haven't been there and they've been quashed strategically. And there's money in organization that has maintained a perspective in a certain way. So once you begin chipping away at that, there's no question. Uh, that you're going to receive a storm uh, back at you. Um, and I think, you know, in thinking through that too, it's like, okay, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to be of service, to make a difference, um, whether that means through the seat or not, right? Uh, so the goal ne isn't necessarily how do I stay at the, in the seat at all costs, but it is how do I move the needle? And if you're the one that doesn't survive, the next person that's coming, you have set the proper expectations. But if we're the ones compromising, then we're actually failing the entire movement. It becomes about us staying in a seat rather than a mission, a perspective, a, a voice that's coming forward and building its way, even if not through the first person. Um, so, so those are you know ways to think about um, this. And then of course, you know you might be wrong today, but tomorrow people will realize that you were right. Uh, so that that's another thing that I think um, helps me, you know, go through at the end of it. I mean, you have God's army on your side. What that looks like, we don't know the most effective means of change. I don't even think political office is necessarily the way to change everything. We need people everywhere, right? So what, what that, that is God's plan. Our role is to be those, you know, frontline people facing it, but to fully expect that that's what we're facing. 
Thank you. That's a beautiful way to end this session. Um, and I just want to remind all of our audience to please continue to be ambassadors for the facts and share our resources with your network. I'm going to introduce the next session. It's health policy and advocacy priorities for American Muslims, centering equity led by the American Muslim health professionals. And we heard about, um, you know, just in this past presentation, that um, a third of those who experience discrimination are experiencing it while seeking health care. So I will hand it over to Dr. Sena Sayed, Vice President of the American Muslim Health Professionals. Dr. Sena Sayed is a neurologist who is on the American Muslim Health Professionals Board as the Vice President and Health Policy and Advocacy Director. In her day job, Dr. Sayed is working as a clinical lead at Sanofi US, um, neurohospitalist at Base State Medical Center, and as a tele-neurologist for NeuroX. And with that, um, I will hand it over to Dr. Sayed. Thank you so much. <laughs> 